Okay. Awake. I'm barely awake. Ugh. Oh, we don't want to hear that. <laughs> See, I can say that it never fails. I mean, before you have kids, ah, you don't know nothing about You can't tell nobody nothing about kids. And then after you have kids, oh, you haven't had enough experiences yet. You don't even know. It's like, you can never win. It's like, and I could even have two kids. And you know what? I still wouldn't be able to give advice to anybody who got three kids. Because, well, they got three kids and you only had two. I mean, that's... I'm tired. It's, I mean, you know, I said it once before. I think it's interesting how uh, most of our information in the New Testament about marriage and children come from two people that were neither married nor had kids. So I don't know what you want to do with that, but, um, you know, well, I'll listen to the Bible, but um, if you don't have any kids, but we're not talking about kids today, but we are talking about marriage. Our last message in this series, um, we've been doing a series on marriage, and uh, has it been okay? You guys, yes, you liked it? Good? Good. Okay. Um, we, we, discovered, we, we talked about a few different aspects within marriage. Before we get into it, though, we got a, we got a disclaimer, right? I know that most of you are here, but we got some new people in, in with this series, and so we got to make sure everybody's on the same page with a disclaimer. Okay, is there any such thing as a perfect marriage? No. no. Is there any one solution that is a quick fix to every problem in marriage? No. no. Okay, we're all qualified to continue with this message. Um, and again, as usual, as the other messages that I've shared, I am not a, the expert on marriage. I'm simply a peer who is just trying to share some of the things that I've learned about marriage through the Word of God and through my own experiences. So take that for what it is. Um, the three different areas that we covered in marriage um, have been intimacy and the, the issue with intimacy, it was mental and emotional intimacy, right? We, we get the other. But mental and emotional intimacy and... and um, I'm just going to like real quick breeze through these because what we're actually going to do today is we're going to take all of these previous messages and we're going to relate them to how Jesus operates in relationship with us and with the church. Because the reality of marriage is that it should be another portrayal of relationship with Jesus, right? Our marriages should be a work in progress to mirror... <laughs> The, the relationship that we have with Christ and how Christ relates to us should be and how we relate to him should be kind of portrayed in marriage. See, this, as Christians, this is what makes our, our marriages so powerful because we have Jesus in there. Um, so I'm just going to real quick read through these and then we're going to go back and we're going to actually tie these all in. But the intimacy uh, was the first one. And without intimacy, you really don't have a relationship. I mean, you can live together, you can have a ring on the finger, and you can, you can be in the same house, but without intimacy, mental and emotional intimacy, you really have no relationship. See, because, because the intimacy was, uh, we said that some people like to say, into me, see, or you could flip it around and say, see into me. And so what you're doing in the, in the act of intimacy is you're opening yourself up so that somebody else can see who you really are. And you're showing them all of your good, but all of your bad. <laughs> and you're giving them the opportunity prior to marriage, this is why it should be done in the dating thing, the mental and emotional. Okay? Mental and emotional intimacy should be achieved prior to marriage. Because the other individual has the right, they should have the right to see all of who you are and say, I don't know if I'm really cut out for that. I don't know if I can really commit to that. Because you don't want to be with somebody who can't love you for who you really are. That's a bad marriage. You want to make sure that the person you're with is a person who understands completely the good and the bad about you and says, you know what, I've seen all the good, I've seen all the bad, I love you anyways, and I will commit the rest of my life to be with you. 
And that no matter what happens from this moment forward, no matter what may come out of your past, no matter what things are in the lingering that, that you think are haunting you, when they come up, you know what? We're going to deal with them. We're going to talk about them. And we're going to work through them because I already know about it. It's not a surprise. Get into marriage, two years into marriage, and surprise! There's a closet you didn't see before you got married, and what's in there? Oh my goodness. And now you're in a tough spot. Because you didn't expect that. It just blindsided you out of nowhere. Those are the kinds of things that we should be discussing in the dating process. Who are we, really? And then we talked about the, the second message was on independence. And the biggest thing about independence is that there is no room in a marriage for a feminist woman or a sexist male, correct? correct. It, it cannot exist in a marriage. A marriage is no place for that. Independence, understanding true independence when you come into a marriage relationship is key. It's, it's really hard for people who have been single for a long time. Yeah. Because <laughs> the Bible tells us what? That the two shall become one flesh, right? And that is really hard when you've been one flesh for a really long time. And then you've got to join with another flesh. And the other flesh don't do it the way your flesh did it. And the other flesh got different desires than your flesh did. And now somewhere you've got to try to figure all this out and work all this out. It's, it, it gets a little hard. And then the third one that we talked about um, last time was change, the issue of change. And the biggest issue that we have with change in relationships, most of the times the way it goes is that, you know, the, the, the woman, most of the time, okay, I'm not trying to stereotype or anything, but most of the time the woman will get upset at the man because the man hasn't changed. I've been married to him for 15 years and he don't change. I mean, he's the same man that I met, that I got married to, and you would think over this period of time, there would have been, I mean, he don't pick, after 15 years, I still can't get him to pick his underwear up off the floor. <laughs> and then the guy, probably, I don't know why she changed. She ain't the same person I married. I mean, she is totally different. She ain't spontaneous anymore. She wants a plan for everything. Gotta be in order before we could just go and spend money. Now she wants to save money. I don't know. <laughs> so we talked about change in marriage. And, and what we talked about in change is that uh, relationship causes change. No change, no relationship. That's simple. If there is no change, then I can say without a doubt there is no relationship. Well, but we're married. I don't care. If there's no change, there's no relationship. Some changes happen immediately. But some changes take a lifetime to get worked out. Some things, oh, it's easy, you know. Whew, I can flip that switch. Yeah, I'm done. All right, drop that. I'm cool with that. Other things, it's like, I'll probably die and still be struggling with change in that area. <laughs> it's just so, things get so ingrained in us. And they become so hard to change. And so there are three ingredients to change. There are, and, and what we looked at in that message was, was, the reality that in most cases, our theology of change doesn't line up with our practice of change in our marriages. We have this understanding of change, this theology of change. We know what change is scripturally. We know kind of how it works scripturally. But for some reason, when we get into a marriage, we kind of, I guess, think it just doesn't apply in the marriage or I don't know. Because the three ingredients to change are forgiveness, repentance, and what was the other one? Did I forget or did you forget? Did we both forget? Did we both forget? <laughs> grace. Great. Repentance, forgiveness, and grace. That's the three ingredients to change. Without all of those, you don't have change. 
There has to be repentance for change because repentance is the initial act of change for the individual. The individual receives some truth or they receive some information about something that they didn't previously know or that they were doing something wrong or that, that something needs to change. And so repentance is when I have a different thought about the way I was doing things and now I'm thinking of doing them differently. And, and Or I was going in this direction, but I turn around and I go this direction because I see that this direction was either unprofitable or it was wrong in, in relation to sin, it would be wrong. Or if I just need to go another direction because now I've got a new understanding of more truth and so I need to change the direction that I'm going to fit with the new truth that I have understood. And so... Repentance is the first step, but without forgiveness, the change doesn't happen. Because what would happen, and we ask this question, what would happen if you came to God and, and you, you heard about God, you heard about His Son, and, and you heard about the work that He did, and He died for sinners, and whew, man, thank you, Lord. And, and we understand that, that, that one of the steps to get into this thing is that, that we need to come before the Father, and we just simply need to repent. But what if... At that moment, God said, yeah. sorry, no, you failed. I'm not going to forgive you for that. <laughs> Wait, yeah. what? what? What does that do to a person? Yeah, it's true. Forget it. You know what? Forget it. I don't need to change. If there's no forgiveness, I'm not going to change. As right or wrong as that may be, that's the reality of what would happen. With no forgiveness, there's no change. Grace is the third ingredient to that. There has to be grace. Grace was not the issue with grace and the aspect of change is that it's not grace inside me causing me to change. It's grace from the other individual towards me when I make my failures. They show grace towards me, which gives me time and it gives me the boldness to continue in spite of the fact that I failed. Grace then is the opposite of condemnation. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Amen. Why? Because it, condemnation is a change killer. Condemnation will never bring change. The minute you, you, you condemn somebody for a failure, you stop the change. Grace is the time. It's the allotted time. So when I have a failure, grace says there's still time for change. You can still change. It's okay. We'll work through this. Yes, sometimes there are consequences for actions. Yes, sometimes there's discipline that needs to take place for actions. But grace says you're not condemned for those actions. Let's keep going. It gives you the boldness to be able to live life unafraid of failure. So, now we get to see how all of this works in relationship. I really don't know too much how this is all going to go. So I just thought I'd throw that out there, and you know, you guys could probably say, well, he's, he's, he's unprepared. No, I'm prepared, I promise you. But um, I just don't know exactly how it's all going to turn out. Matthew chapter 19. Let's read our, our core section of scripture for this. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. chapter 19, starting in verse 4, it says, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And this was the, the premise for this whole series. This is what started it all. 
And so, in this, we find the issue of intimacy. Um, I mean, the two becoming one flesh, that's pretty intimate, right? You can say yes. <laughs> it is a little, you know, I know, sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta let people know that it's okay to interact. We're, we're okay with that. Um, yes, uh, two becoming one flesh is, is a pretty intimate thing. But, but that issue, we'll, we'll get more into that a little bit because that's, that actually is more with uh, the issue of independence, really, when you start looking at it, than intimacy. Um, so, you know, like that one. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Please turn there. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. See, we say that intimacy between spouses is when we completely open up to the other person. And we let them see all of us. We let them see who we are. And so we have this idea of what intimacy looks like in relationship with Christ. And as Christians, we, we kind of have a thought of what intimacy looks like. I would probably say that for a lot of Christians, I think I can safely say this without overgeneralizing, but for, I think for a lot of Christians, um, intimacy with Jesus looks like a one-sided conversation. Meaning, I am completely open with Jesus, and I, you know, confess everything to Jesus, and I, I before Jesus but there's no reciprocal communication. I think that a lot of Christians view it that way. How are you intimate with you? Why? Well, I, I tell him everything. Or I confess everything. Well, does he ever talk back to you? I mean, is, he, is there this relationship? Well, I mean, I, I pray. Okay. But is there, is, see, because intimacy was, is never a one-sided thing. Into, for intimacy, by definition, to be established, it has to be reciprocal. It has to go both ways. The two people in a relationship have to be open with each other. If we're really, if we're really intimate, we have to be open with each other. I have to be open with her, and she has to be open with me. Otherwise, intimacy is not established. It doesn't matter how open I am with her. If she's not open with me, there's still no intimacy. Not really. Doesn't necessarily mean I didn't try. It just means that it hasn't been established. So for true intimacy to be established, both parties in a relationship have to have to do this thing. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. <coughs> for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We have expounded on this verse a lot in, in, of recent because there's so much understanding of, of what is really taking place at the cross in this verse. And what we understand is that when we look at this verse in the Greek, and it says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, when it says he made him, that word made, that first word made, is a change of identity. In the Greek, it means to change identity. So you take something that already exists that has an identity, and you change its identity. It's not a new creation. It's the, it's, it was one thing, but it's now another. Its identity has been changed. And so what, what Paul is saying here is that for he made him, Jesus, for God made Jesus, who knew no sin. The, the current identity of Jesus prior to the cross was sinless, perfect, holy, spotless Son of God. 
But see, even if we go back to the Old Testament, we look at the sacrificial lamb. What happened is a sacrificial lamb. The priest would lay their hands on the, the sacrificial lamb and confess the sins of the people over it, right? And, and what was taking place spiritually, as far as what God had told them, is that the sins of the people were being transferred onto that lamb. And that lamb's identity from pure and spotless was being changed to sin. And so when that lamb was killed, they were really killing the sins of the people. And it says he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. God made, he changed the identity of Christ on the cross. Sinless, perfect, spotless. Yes, he was still there, sinless, perfect, spotless. But there was an identity shift. He also became the sin of the world. <coughs> and it was all laid on him. And so when God's wrath was poured out on the cross, it was not poured out on his son, it was poured out on sin. Yes, his son bore the sin, I mean... But understand, it's important to make that distinction. Because otherwise we walk through life with this idea that if God's wrath was poured out on His Son, then what keeps God's wrath from being poured out on me? But if God's wrath was poured out on sin and not His Son, then I can have this boldness to come into the throne room of God and know that His wrath is not against me. You say, well, what in the world does that have to do with intimacy? Because in this moment, when Jesus takes on the sin of the world, do you know what that means? That means at this moment, 2,000 years ago, Jesus is seeing into you. And he sees all the good and all the bad. Nothing is hidden from his sight. And he sees it all. That's already, man, isn't that awesome? <laughs> I mean, think about it. In physical relationship, I gotta worry about telling somebody all the bad that didn't previously know all the bad. And now I gotta worry about what they're gonna think about me. And if they're just gonna walk away and, and, and not be embarrassed or, or ashamed, if there's not gonna be any grace, if there's gonna be condemnation, if there's gonna be. I gotta worry about all that stuff. But with Christ, I don't have to worry about any of it because he already saw it before I was even born. And in spite of the fact of all the mistakes and all of the failures that I would ever make, guess what? He still decided somewhere that in 1979 that there would be a seed planted inside of a womb that would produce Rick Prince. In spite of all of the failures I had yet to live out. What a God. Yes. <laughs> he already saw it all. Yep, he did. And you say, so where's the reciprocal then? The reciprocal is him hanging on the cross. The reciprocal to intimacy is that at the moment of the cross, through the life of Jesus, and all the way up to the cross, including the cross and the resurrection, we actually got to see into God. Yeah. We got to, we can achieve intimacy with God just simply by looking at the life of Jesus and seeing into the heart of the Father through His Son. He said, this is who I am. You see, because at the end of this thing, my son is going to have full knowledge of who you are. But from, from the beginning of this thing until the end of this thing, I want you to have a glimpse of who I am. And so this is me. And God opens up and shows us who he really is. Yes. <sighs> 
greater intimacy. For three years, see the life of his son on this earth as he walks through the face of this earth, showing the heart of the Father. Displaying the heart of the Father. Speaking the heart of the Father. Wow. <coughs> I don't know about you, but that does something for me in my relationship with God. Yeah. To know, to, to be able to look into the heart of God and say, oh, this is the heart of God. I can see it. I can see it. You know what? In the middle of my despair, I can see the heart of God. In the middle of my hopelessness, I can see the heart of God. In the middle of my tragedy, I can still see the heart of God. Yeah. And instead of getting angry at him for not saving me from it, praise him for helping me through it. Because there's things that I learned walking through it about God that I never knew before. That I couldn't have known if he would have saved me from it. The whole purpose of this was so we end up like this, not like this. See, the twisted rope, if there's no intimacy with God, we just end up being the twisted rope. We just wrap ourselves around religion. We wrap ourselves around the church. We wrap ourselves around, you know, Christianese speak. And I can speak it better than you can speak it. So that makes me a better Christian. Well, it may mean that you're wound tighter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> but see, the problem with this, if we're just wrapped around it, we, the moment an offense comes into our life, we become unwrapped. We don't know how to handle it. We don't know what we're doing. Why? Because there's never been any intimacy. Intimacy is the braided rope. Intimacy is that we have, have been braided and woven together. And then no matter what comes our way, you can cut this rope and it's still strong. You cut that rope, it comes apart. Yep. And no matter what happens, we're still strong. Why? Because I have intimacy with my Savior. I don't fall apart in the trial. You know why I don't fall apart in the trial? Because I've seen into God. Yes. <laughs> Knowing that He's seen into me. Yes. And He loved me anyways. Yeah. And He died for me anyways. But he also, in that process, let me see into him. And when I have seen into him, when I have understood his word, read his word, meditated on his word, then I establish this intimacy with God. I see into the heart of God. And I know in the midst of my trial, no matter how hard the enemy wants to make it look like this thing is not true, I can stand out in and say, no, devil, you're a liar. That's right. That's right. Because I have seen into the heart of God and no matter what you say can change anything that I have seen. What does that got to do with our marriage? That's what your marriage should be like. Your marriage should be one of so much intimacy and so much openness with each other that you have seen perfectly into the heart of each other that no matter what hard times come, you say, we can make it through this because we have established a relationship. Amen. Marriage is supposed to be, listen, marriage is supposed to be one of the strongest unions possible on the face of this earth. That's right. That nothing can come against it and break it down. The reason why it happens, the 
the reason why they fall apart is because they don't understand. They, they never achieved those levels of intimacy. They've been living independent from each other while living together. And they've refused to change anything in the midst of this relationship. And so the marriages fail time and time and time again. And we're on our, th we're on our third marriage. And will we just got our fingers crossed on this one? Third time's the charm. Oh, dear Lord. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm not condemning you, okay? If you're in your third marriage and you're, you're, man, you get, you're here, you're getting it figured out, praise God, you know, keep working at it. But that's not the pattern. Intimacy. It makes our relationship with Christ indestructible. It makes our relationship with each other indestructible. Intimacy. Independence. The next one. Go back to Matthew chapter 19, verse 4 through 6. Matthew chapter 19, sorry, verse 4, and he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? He said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, when we look at this section of scripture in the Greek, we find out some very interesting things. Uh, first of all is that we find out that that word for one in the Greek is not uh, talking about numerically. I, you know, I, I've always been one, uh, like an extreme literalist, okay? If, you want, if people tell me something, it's like, really? Wow. Some people call it gullible. Um, but I take things literally. I mean, not just expect when people tell me something that that's, I've learned. <laughs> not quite that way anymore. But um, one of the things that I took literally was this, was this verse. And I'm thinking, <laughs> the, the two become one flesh. It, I mean, aside from a sci-fi movie that I think I saw once, I'm not real sure how the merging of flesh works like that. It, you know, I mean, and that one didn't turn out pretty. The guy walked into the machine and it came out and he was like, ugh, two people just, one, ugh, ugh. And so, really? I mean, that's what we get in marriage? How do we get, I mean, because we're still two people, right? It's not a trick question, right? We're still two people? Yep. Okay. But he says we did two people become one flesh. And I'm like, uh, I mean, do they like, like hook a little tether to each other and just walk around on it? It, it? it is not a numerical value when it says the two become one flesh. The one, in definition, means first, it means agreement, and it means unity. Flesh, when we look at the flesh, what is the flesh? Everything that makes up the flesh is the mind, the will, and the emotions, right? This is our flesh, the mind, will, and emotions. First agreement, unity, mind, will, and emotions. The two become one flesh. That means in the area of the mind, will, and emotions, the two individuals start to put each other first. They come into agreement on things, and then they act in unity. That's what it means. You still have your two individuals in the house. But now instead of being your independent bad self before you got married, Ooh, I just leave whenever I want, I come home whenever I want, I go do whatever I want, hang out with the boys as late as I want, hang out with the girls as late as I want, go do whatever. Uh -uh. Why is our marriage? We just need to give each other space. 
No, you need to learn how to live together. That's right. Yes. Amen. You need to learn how to live in each other's space. Because the reality of marriage is that when they are joined together, the two who are separate individuals start to put each other first. We start to prefer one another over the other. In other words, before I make a decision, I'm thinking about how it's going to affect her. I think about how this is going to affect her mentally, physically, and emotionally. What is she going to think about it? How is she going to react to it? What are the emotions associated with this? Is it going to make her mad? Is it going to make her happy? These are the thoughts that start to invade my mind. Paul was right on here with this. That's why he said, if you don't have to get married, don't. Because when it comes down to it, you're going to prefer them probably even over the Lord. You're going to think about them more than you're going to think about anybody else. That's the concept of marriage. You think about the other person more than you think about yourself. Yes. I know, it's like, whoa, what? <laughs> I walked into the wrong church this morning. Man, I didn't <laughs> go somewhere else. <laughs> you think about them first. And the issues come up. Uh, he got this, and he wasn't thinking about me. Actually, he probably was thinking about you. That's why he didn't ask you. Because he knew what your reaction would be if he asked you. And as we stated last time, you know, it, sometimes it's just easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. And so we just, sometimes we just do things because, oh, I'm fully, I was, I was 100% in tune with you, baby. When, when I thought about this and, and you were the first person on my mind <laughs> I, yeah I still got it <laughs> and you're going to have to forgive me <laughs> but that's the reason I didn't ask I was thinking about you though I promise it goes both ways it's not just a guy thing to the girl it goes both ways so the two become one flesh but we don't become one spirit <laughs> You want to know, this is so cool. I just found this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I know I've read this section of verses countless times. And it never really clicked until just recently. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 17, check this out. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now, in the Greek, that one is not first agreement and unity. In the Greek, that one is numerical, one. Um, it's one. So go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. <coughs> for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made. The first made was change of identity. The second made in the Greek is a different word. The second made is to create from scratch. What I can understand, what I can conceive and, and, and what I gather from Scripture and all of Paul's writings is that as we start to lace the writings of Paul through each other and we start to see the overall picture of what Paul is saying. There, there is a thread that is going through them and Paul is, is telling us exactly what has taken place. 
not only in the life of Christ, the death of Christ, but in our salvation, what takes place. Yeah. And what takes place is that if, if I take this understanding and I go back to Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein. As I continue to read in the Bible, I see that there are two spirits. There is the spirit of man, and there is the spirit of God. And man is born with a spirit. Albeit spiritually dead, they're born with a spirit. The spirit is condemned for eternity to hell already when you're born. But that's the spirit of man. What, what knows the, the things of man but the spirit of man? What knows the things of God but the spirit of God, right? But at the moment of salvation, the thing that happened, Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. Yes. So at the moment that I accept Christ, he takes me back retroactively all the way to the cross. And in that moment, he kills the spirit, the human spirit within me. And in the same instant, he recreates a spirit from himself. And so now I'm not two spirits living in one body that are competing with each other. I am one spirit still, but now this spirit is Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Yeah. It is Jesus residing inside his spirit. I become numerically one with Christ. That is reserved for Christ alone. You can never achieve that with another individual, no matter how hard you may want to try. This is why marriages fall apart on the basis of he's my fulfillment, she's my fulfillment. Your fulfillment was never to be found in anybody but Christ. Because Christ is the only one who combines with you, kills the old human nature, puts in the spirit of God within you, and you become a completely new creation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Verse 17, we are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So in the area of independence, in a relationship with Christ, I'm not independent. I am 100% dependent on Christ. 100%. Whether I live and move and breathe, I do all things in Christ. Yeah. He sustains me. You know why? Because if the spirit of God within me was ever yanked out of me, I'd be dead. Right. There's no other spirit in there that can say, oh, well, we'll just keep on living for a while. It's God's spirit. And if that spirit gets yanked out, it's over. I'm done. So that means every step of my life is 100% dependent upon Christ. Amen. We don't like to think that way in the marriage still. What? Wait, Rick, no, stop. Are you, are you trying to tell me that I, I am 100% dependent upon my spouse? Should be. And your spouse should be 100% dependent upon you. It's a two-way street. But I was doing just fine before I got married. Then why did you get married? <laughs> you should have stayed unmarried. If life was that good, the whole purpose of marriage was to make life better. To join with another individual so that from that moment on, our life together, collectively, would be better than it was separately, individually. That we would enjoy a bond with each other and a relationship with each other where we could tell each other things, where we could encourage each other. Because there's moments where I was weak as an individual that I needed some strength, I needed some help, and there was nobody there to help me. I was alone. But now that I'm married, I've got somebody there to help me through it. I got married so I didn't have to go it alone anymore. And 
And then what? Just to, just to walk out and just say, I just need to be alone? <laughs> really? We got the wrong view of marriage. If that's the case. Something's not, something's not jiving. Because the right view of marriage means that, that we should like to be in each other's presence. That we depend upon each other. That we care for each other. That we do for each other as close as we can in the physical what Christ does for us in the spiritual. Yes. Marriage should be great. It's like a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality in my life. This relationship that I have with Christ, now I have a physical manifestation of it in a relationship with my spouse. That's what marriage is supposed to be. That's what marriage is intended to be. The other issue with identity is that uh, The or independence, the issue with independence is that it's really a lack of understanding of identity. If I feel like I need to be independent, then I really don't know who I am. I have a breakdown in my understanding of my identity. See, because in a marriage relationship, the identity changed. I'm no longer the separate individual. Now we're together. But I feel like I still need to be alone by myself, which means I'm having actually an identity crisis. I don't understand who I really am now. I don't really understand my place or my part in this thing. And because I don't understand my place or my part, then I feel like I need to just continue to go it alone. Continue to be the lone ranger, so to speak. We talked in the sermon about identity is that part of the problem is in the breakdown of, of the, the, the pattern that God had set at the very beginning of the stage. Adam and Eve. I mean, we're going to talk about marriage. You know, let's go back to the first one, right? I mean, because that one was, whew. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Genesis chapter 2, in verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Do you know where this lies in the order of things? In creation? The world was created. The garden was placed in a corner of the world, the Bible says. God created man, put man, singular man, Adam, in the garden. Gave him this task. Woman has not yet been created. My fulfillment's in my husband. His fulfillment should be in me. I mean, I don't understand. Honey, you got me. I just lost my job, but you got me, honey. God gave man work before he gave man a wife. In the order of creation, the thing that man found his fulfillment in prior to being married was work. I'm sorry. That's how God made us. I... But the cool thing is, is it's not to, to diminish or to put down the part of the woman. It's to actually see the awesomeness of the creation of woman. Because the reality was, is that as man was in the garden doing the work that God had called him to do, God looked down and said, you know what? Adam needs some help. I want to make him a helpmate. 
Do you know what that means? See, you think that, that Adam being created first, and I've heard some preachers preach about it. Well, the man was created first. <laughs> Shut up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stop. Because you know, you know what God did in the creation of the woman? Instilled in one body everything that the man needed to get the job done. So God created man, puts him in the garden, gives him a job to do. The man is doing his job. And God says, you know what? He needs a helper. Do you think God was going to give him second best? No. I mean, that's like, John's a carpenter, like I'm a carpenter. That's like the, the boss, Cosmic Construction, and they build like multi-million dollar homes. Cosmic Construction, go to John and say, hey, John, we got you this new Ryobi set of drills to, to, to build this house. I quit. Yeah. I mean, they, they'll, they'll accomplish everything you need to get done. They'll probably break the first 10 minutes you use them, but they, are, they will accomplish everything. No. If they're smart, they're going to give him the best quality materials that he needs to get the job done. They're going to make sure that the tools he has doesn't have a chance of breaking down and costing them more than what it would have cost to just buy the right tools to begin with. Yeah, that's right. Always start with um, hint, hint. In case the men didn't catch that for Christmas, honey, Pastor Rick said we got to get the best tool. For, I, can't get the, I can't get the Black and Decker. Amen. Okay? I need the Makita. I, I know it's a hundred dollars more, but I need it. <laughs> Just trying to help you out, guys. <laughs> so God created woman to be the best tool for the job of completing the work that he had called Adam to do. Think about that in your marriage. You see, this is the way a marriage was supposed to work. The man was supposed to figure out the call of God on his life before hooking up with the woman. Before hooking up with the woman. Because when the woman came to the man, the man could say, this is the work that God has called me to do. And the woman could say, I have a skill set that fits exactly in line with the work that God has called you to do. And I've noticed that through this dating relationship, that this particular skill set that I have not only complements the call on your life, it actually seems to be some areas where you might be a little weak without it, you know. <laughs> you're a dumb husband. I mean, you're a dumb man. <laughs> you know, that's... I mean, that's the way you kind of get portrayed sometimes through commercials and stuff. My husband. And he's like hung up in the blinds or something. <laughs> but if a man knows the call on his life, if he knows the work that God has called him to, then when you start to think about a spouse, you already know the direction the spouse needs to be geared to be going. And if that's not a call or direction on the spouse's life, somewhere along the line, this thing may not work out. Say, so, well, you know, I mean, there hasn't been this sermon for how many years? And how many years have people, I mean, have people existed on this earth and they got married and they made it? Yeah, we made it. Rough. Part of the reason why so many people got married and made it way back when was because divorce wasn't even a word. And, uh, no. No. 
We refuse to even say that word in this house. Don't even. Mm. True. That's no. Right. Because marriage was viewed as a holy union. And even people who weren't Christians had a greater sense of morality in that sense. To at least understand that when you're married, you're still married for life. And so we figure it out. But what if you didn't have to figure it out after you were married? What if you got to figure it out before you got married? Teens? What if you got to, to say, you know what? Before I get crazy, I need to set some boundaries. Boundaries help for when you start getting crazy. Because they're the rails that you can bounce off of to keep you in the middle. <laughs> See the bumpers on the side of the bowling alley? Yeah. Man, some of those little kids, they go crazy, man. Where did it go? And it's like, burn, 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 burn. But it makes it all the way down, and somehow or another, they get a strike. Yeah. I don't get <laughs> that. Because when I, and it's like in the middle, and it, and one pin left. Nine. Crazy nuts. But the boundaries kept them in line. When, when they were out of control, the boundaries kept them going in the right direction. So next time your kids think your parents are out of line for setting boundaries, you don't have the place to tell them that. Because those boundaries are set there to keep you going in the right direction when you're out of control. That's right. Yes. Which happens way more often than you would ever admit. <laughs> Thank you, Mom and Dad, for the boundaries. How about that once? Go home and say that once. <laughs> I can't stand this place. I wait to get there's too many rules. Why don't you say thank you for the boundary because it keeps me going in the straight path so I don't get into the wrecks. Yep. Uh, that was, I'm, this is not a parenting message. This is, <laughs> so I have not enough experience to talk about this yet. <laughs> See, when the man knows what he's doing and he informs the woman of the job that is ahead of them and then he empowers her to help him complete the task that God has already given him, then they work in union and he has his fulfillment because he's doing the work that God has called him to do and her fulfillment, you see, she was created as the helpmate. So her fulfillment is when she's helping you. When she's helping the man, she's feeling fulfilled. She doesn't need to look outside of the marriage to find fulfillment. If you are doing what you're supposed to be doing as the man in your job and your calling in life, and you have con conveyed that information to her, the reason why she steps outside of that, the reason why we have this whole feminist movement is because they, they did not tell the women what the men's job were. The men didn't care. It's my job. I'll do it. I don't need you. Then why are you married? To have children. No. no. <laughs> you were, go back to Genesis. Yeah. The whole reason this marriage union came into existence was because man needed some help. Get off your stubborn high horse and admit you need some help. Thank you for marrying me. Thank you for being willing to help me. Here is what we're doing. These are the areas where I lack, where you're strong. These are the areas where you lack, where I'm strong. Let's come together. Let's do this thing together. And we can accomplish great things for the Lord. First Corinthians six nine through eleven. 
Oh, one last note on the, the work thing. He said, well, did Jesus model that? To the, yeah, he did. When he came down, he was doing the work of his father, right? He said, I am doing the work my father sent him to do. And then when he left, and, and we talk about the church as being the bride of Christ, what did he do? He told them the work that he was doing and said, now continue doing the work. He commissioned the church to work with him to accomplish the work that he was doing. So he brought his bride into work with him and said, this is the call that God, that Father God has put on my life and this is the work that I want you to help me do as my bride. And so now the church, empowered by Christ himself, led by Christ himself, but also free within that area to fulfill that calling. And so we partner with Christ to do the work that he's already been sent to do. He said, go make disciples. Who actually makes the disciple? Jesus does. Right? So Jesus is still doing what he's called to do, but we are commissioners. He has commissioned us to step into that position and to work with him. Now that the conversion takes place, we continue to teach. We continue to, to, to be there for support, to strengthen. That's the job. And so the church finds its fulfillment when it is doing the work that God has called him to do. And it looks different for different churches to some degree because there's different ministries. Prison ministry, youth ministry, old folks home ministry, and, and there's probably like every church in town is really big in one of those areas. But yet we're all under the same ministry of reconciliation, of, of bringing others to Christ so that he can then change them and change is where we go. Next, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Shame on you. Bad people. Oh, it doesn't stop. But <laughs> you're washed. Yes. You're sanctified. Yes. You're justified yes. in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Yes. Change. In the midst of the relationship. You see, I came into a relationship with Christ and there was immediate change. Yes. But I also know that some of that stuff is still working in the flesh. And so some of those things are still going to be battles in the flesh from now until the day I die. I have not yet arrived. And when I cross over on the other side and I die and I wake up in heaven, then I will have arrived. And until then, I'm working on arriving. So it's this continuous progression of change. I continually change, and as change continues, it may be slower in some than others, and some issues may take longer for some people to get over than others, and there are certain changes that are going to take a lifetime, and they may never fully be implemented. But as long as I'm seeing the change progressing, then I can step back and without a doubt I can say there is true relationship there. There is true relationship. They may not be where they want to be. They may not be where I would like them to be. But there is consi consistent change in their life, which means that they have had a consistent relationship. See, when I came into a relationship with Joy, dear Lord, there were so many things that needed to change. I mean, you talk about the old saying, foot loose and fancy free. 
<laughs> and now it's like, <laughs> and it's like, I mean, it's like she had a, a rope to hurricane or something. It's like, oh, okay. oh no, over here, no, over here. You know? And it's like she's trying to hang on, and I'm just like, ah. I was out of control. But in our 10, almost 10 years of marriage, there has been consistent, gradual change. You know what that says? That for the last 10 years, we've been in relationship. Cross your legs. Put your feet under your chair. No, I'll step on your toes. <laughs> it didn't happen through nagging. It's never going to happen through nagging. I don't know why you don't have every single day. Do we have to go through this every single day? Yeah, we got to go through this every day. I mean, and I can yell with the best of them. And we can have some arguments. I mean, I'm here to tell you what. That is not how effectual change is going to take place. Get off each other. Lighten up. How about instead of railing on them, you start actually talking to them? Hey, honey, how, when they walk in the door at night, and whether it's the man or the woman, okay, because I've heard some male nagging that is horrible. I mean, this is, it's like, dude, no, you're the dude. <laughs> Quit. You sound like the girl. Quit, dude. I'm serious. Stop it. How about when they come home? Hey, honey, how was your day? How did things go today? You see, no matter what you think is wrong, that you're really upset about, that you're really angry about, that you think they just disrespected you or they don't care about you or they never listened to you, do you realize that when they walk in the door is not the time for that? Come on, come on. We can talk about this later, but right now, when we first come back together after being apart all day, what we should be doing is saying, rejoining this union. We've been separated all day. How was your day? What did you do? How did things go? What were your trials? What were your successes? Yeah. That's right. And once that has been established and we have communion back together, now, hey, I noticed, you know, the thing that I asked that you would take care of before you left for work this morning, you didn't do it. And I really could have used your help on that. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's get that taken care of. I'll, I'll do it now. I just don't know why there's no peace in our home. Really? Just set a little recorder on the counter in your home and let it play and forget about it. And then go back at the end of the day and listen to it. And hear yourself. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Whoa. I sound like that? No, I mean, I really said all those things. Yeah. Wow. My tongue was really that sharp. Yeah, yeah it was. Change is not going to happen by the continual nagging. Proverbs, I love Proverbs. Proverbs says that the continual nagging of a woman is worse than a dripping faucet. It is drip, 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 drip. And that could go for men too. It drip, 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 drip. And you're like, I can't sleep. I can't every time I come home. It's a drip, drip, drip. Yes, I said, I am. Driving me nuts. The 
Bible's all full of all sorts of cool stuff. You, know, you should read it sometimes. It's great. <laughs> but in a relationship with Christ, you see, He brings freedom. You see, change in relationship with Christ is a change to freedom. It's not a change to bondage. We come into a marriage relationship and we don't want to change because it feels like the change is just bondage. You just want me to change so you can have control over me. But a marriage relationship change is supposed to be for freedom. The reason I've made the changes I have in our marriage is because it has freed us. Financially, it has freed us. If I didn't put the brakes on the spending, guess what? Yeah. There would be more bondage. Yes. And even though getting the reins put on the spending felt like bondage, it was actually bringing freedom. Yes. And thank God for it. Because where would we be today without it? We wouldn't have a house. We wouldn't have a car. Not a nice one. We'd be in debt up to our eyeballs instead of having paid all of our debt credit off. I'm almost done. trying to convey today is that a marriage relationship is supposed to be the strongest, most freeing, most empowering union that anybody can ever come into. It should never be looked at as a jail. Yeah. It should never be looked at as now I have to give up the fun. Now I have to give up the things I like to do. It should never be looked at in those terms. Yeah. We made a joke of it and shame on us for making a joke of it. That's we right. tell the guy the night before he goes, he goes in to get married, well, it's your last night of freedom. All insane is coming tomorrow. No. And then we live like we're under a ball and chain and we can't figure it out. You just spoke it over yourself and we've been speaking it over the marriages that have taken place in our country for, for generations. And we can't figure out, why are they not free? Why are they not liberated within the marriage? Why are they not happy within the marriage? Because we've been speaking that marriage is not the free place. It's not the liberating place. But the reality of the word of God is that it says that marriage is the place of freedom. That in marriage we should find greater freedom than when we are independent. should be something desired and sought after and something held so precious. Something that is so valuable that we say, I'm never going to let it go. Uh -uh. No. See, because inside this relationship, there's freedom. There's grace. There's forgiveness. There's repentance. There's no condemnation. There's intimacy. There's change. There's, there's no fighting over independence. We are completely 100% dependent upon each other, and you know what? We're happy about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything we do, we check with the other one. We talk to them. We ask them how they feel about it, and then we come into an agreement on it, and then we make a decision, and we act in unity. By the way, parents, I miss. I have a parenting message. <laughs> But if you did that with your children, if you were facing decisions with your children and your children came in, hey mom, hey dad, can I do it? You know what? Let me talk to you, your father. Let me talk to your mother about it. Yeah. And then we come into an agreement on it. Yeah. And then after we make an agreement on it, we stand in unity on it. Yeah. Amen. And it's not going to be any of this. You go behind the back and, yeah. hey dad, can I, well, what'd your mom say? Um, to ask you. Really? 
well, I guess, and then you find out, no, it's not what happened. Yeah. Mm. It's not a parenting message. It doesn't matter. That helps in marriage. If we face life in marriage, you see, we get faced. The biggest problems that usually come our way in our marriage hit us when we're not around our spouse. The enemy is not stupid. He came to Eve when she was away from Adam for a reason. Because he knew Adam would have just probably punched him in the eye and said, get out of our marriage. <coughs> so if I can separate them, and then when they're separated, if I can just hit one of them. Because the success of their marriage depends on what they're going to do with the information that they receive when they were separate when they come back together. Now, this is what happened today. See why it's so important to begin the conversation at the end of the day when they walk in the door that way? Because when you start nagging on them, when they come in the door, guess what? <laughs> Shut down. That's it. I ain't telling you about the bad stuff that happened today. Go ahead, because I'm angry. Yeah, that's true. And you just added more bad stuff. And the thing that we should be talking about right now and figuring out how we're going to deal with this situation, I'm just going to stuff it inside and I'm not going to tell you about it. And then it becomes a bigger problem and a bigger problem. And then they said, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> like you gave me a chance. <laughs> yeah. As soon as I walk in the door, it was... Rah, 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 rah. I thought we fixed that faucet. I got to quit. The relationship in marriage should be so strong that when you look at your spouse, just like Adam looked at Eve and said, oh, Eve. God, you're going to have to figure this out because I'm not leaving my spouse. so strong that when Eve sinned, Adam, Eve was deceived. Adam was not. We can rail on him all we want to, but I bet if you ask him in eternity, Adam, what happened? I'm just putting this in there, the same scripture, I can't point to a verse, but I believe Adam would say, I loved her. What was I supposed to do? I loved her. Was I supposed to just let her be completely separated from me forever? I loved her. She was my wife. What would you have done? God in his graciousness had it all planned out from the beginning. He knew the love he put in Adam was so strong for his wife that he had a redemption in mind long before Adam even said okay. I'm not telling you to fall into sin if your spouse is sinning. But I'm telling you to stand by your spouse. No matter what the sin. <coughs> and say, I don't agree with it. And I may not have to, I don't have to accept it. And I don't have to be okay with it. 
but you're still my spouse, and we're married, and I love you. I love you more than your sin. I love you more than your failures, and we'll work through this thing, and we'll figure it out. How strong should marriage really be? How awesome of a union is it intended to be? We're going to close with that second to last song. Who is there like you? If you guys need to come and pray over anything, or I just encourage you as we close, get a new, get a new excitement about your marriage. Get a renewed excitement. Expectation. What did God really bring us together for? I mean, what is the end of this thing really supposed to look like? What, what plans and purposes is he working to accomplish through us? Man, I can't wait to live the rest of my life with my wife to figure that out. Because I don't know what it is, but it's awesome. <laughs> He put two powerful people together. <laughs> there's, there's a plan there somewhere. <laughs> Let's live it out. Value your marriage. If you need to change in the area of intimacy, independence, or, or change, do it. It's worth it. It's worth it.